we will start i think by the time uh, he will join okay let's start uh, so today is a privilege for us to listen to uh, <clears throat> very renowned speakers who are having in depth knowledge we are going to have deliberations on uh, <clears throat> on the practical issues faced by all the valuers under ibc uh, to educate us uh, and to do the honors uh, we have uh, the empaneled and enlightened the panelist uh, first is uh, mr ankit goel he is a founding partner of aaa uh insolvency professional <coughs> professionals triple a valuation professionals and also he is a partner senior partner in triple uh, a g and co llp chartered accountants and also a director in triple <coughs> a capital services he is one of the most uh, sought after speakers across the region <coughs> i mean across the country you see any of the uh, regions having any kind anything to do with the valuation he is one of the speakers there and today he is coming here to enlighten us on ibc valuation second is uh, mr venkat subarao as you all know he is the founding member of our bangalore valuer association he was one of the founding members of first uh, ips uh, in southern india and currently he is uh, the president of our bangalore uh, valuers association giving directions to our associations and creating many more uh, enlightening sessions and uh, also we have uh, uh, ravi shankar devar konda he is also a registered valuer and insolvency professional he has an experience of over 35 years uh, at senior levels uh, his last uh, stint was uh, he was the cfo of a nice company which is one of the biggest uh, uh, infrastructure company <coughs> in this region and uh, he is also one of the panelist shilpa any shrinivasan is there today Uh, I, I request uh, Mr. Ramamurthy Shrinivasan to explain to the participants. I don't think he is there. He he is there. Maybe he has to unmute himself, and then explain the participants how we are going. Sorry, ahead. I I had not unmuted myself. Okay, okay. so let me also have the honor of uh, introducing Shrinivasan sir. Again, Shrinivasan is a chartered accountant, and he is also a trainer in various RBOs for valuers. he is also founding member of uh, our uh, bangalore valley association and presently is the secretary taking care of secretary role and he has uh, had a enriching experience in different industrial sectors across uh, india and also he has traveled abroad to to all his services so today he will be moderating the session so over to you sir uh thank you ravi uh, it will be my uh, pleasure and uh, privilege uh, to be moderating the uh, session today we have an eminent uh, uh, selection of uh, panelists uh, mr ravi shankar mr subarao and mr ankit goel of uh, i think his name is triple a associates so he is um, uh, mr ankit goel I mean, uh, ravi shankar and uh, subarao are known to us in uh, bangalore valuers association but uh, mr ankit goel is uh, renowned uh, Uh, let us say all india he has an all india presence and uh, he has wide experience in uh, uh, both the valuation and uh, insolvency matters so the the uh, topic of the day is uh, valuation issues in connection with uh, ibc so all of us uh, who are valuers and who are doing carp and uh, ibc valuation will uh, know that we have some uh, challenges which is you know mostly the company is closed books are not available details are not available promoters are not cooperating there these are the kind of uh, issues we face and when you come to the specifics we will have issues like balance confirmation about uh, inventory and nobody being around to tell you what is the condition of inventory whether it is saleable usable not saleable then you have um, you know controversies on fair value and liquidation value when you will take fair value when you will apply going concern who will provide data for you know making a going concern assessment what is the reliability of uh, that data how do you value intangible assets when the company itself is closed or you know is, um, is about to be closed 
So these are some of the concerns uh, we will be um, uh, dealing today. The, the panelists uh, uh, will uh, take us through their experience and um, their and give their insights on how these issues are to be done. With this uh, few words, I will hand over to uh, Mr. Subha Rao to take it forward. Subha Rao is, uh, of course, the president, uh, also the president of uh, Bangalore's, Bangalore Values Association. Over to you, Subha Rao. Uh, just to yeah. add uh, to Mr. Ramamurthy Srinivasan, uh, today's session is designed in such a way that each of the panelists will uh, uh, take some time and explain through the uh, the practical issues what they have faced while IBC valuation. Followed by, you know, already we have received a, a few questions which will be taken up by the panelists. After that, followed by general Q and A session. This is the design of the today's program. Over to you, Mr. Subara. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shilpa. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, today, uh, before going uh, the panel discussion, we will see the IBC valuation. Uh, I request Shilpa. Uh, to take a poll, uh, how many uh, valuations conducted by each uh, members, like each evaluator? Uh, Shilpa, can you start that poll? Yeah, today being a CEP credit, uh, we also have to launch a few poll questions, which we'll be doing during the session. Uh, I request everyone to participate so that the poll report will be sent to uh, IVBI. Yes, uh, we have the poll result. Uh, there are 50% percent people, okay, members still not done any valuation and 21% less than five and five to 10, 14% and more than 10, 14%. Uh, then what we do, we will just go through, uh, since uh, there are um, uh, members not done any valuation, we will go through IBC valuation, uh, the structure, then we will start with the practical challenges. Yes, uh, IBC valuation. Uh, would Maybe. you like to select presentation mode for your PPT? Yeah. Yes. Everybody, everybody can see current uh, presentation. Yes. Yeah, as you know that uh, regulation 27 of uh, IBBA insolvency resolution process for corporate persons regulations 2016, uh, IRP or RP shall appoint two registered valuers within seven days from the commencement from the appointment of as resolution professional. If the RP is not uh, appointed by the COC or by the adjudicating authority, the IRP shall appoint uh, within uh, 47 days. Before 47 days, the IRP shall appoint uh, two registered valuers. And these two registered valuers shall give the fair value and liquidation value in accordance with the internationally accepted valuation standards. Here, this has been specified in the IBBA rules itself, uh, internationally accepted valuation standards we have to follow. You know, we will discuss uh, on this topic, whether we have to follow uh, international valuation standards or ICI standards or other RBOs standards. After physical verification of the inventory and the fixed assets of the corporate data. Here, uh, whoever, whether it is land and building and plant and machinery, uh, they have to uh, physically verify the assets as well as as a uh, securities or financial assets value. It is good, okay, if you uh, visit, if, the, if they have any inventory or if you can visit once the corporate uh, data. And uh, if the two, the two values, like fair value, liquidation value, like uh, significantly different, the resolution professional shall appoint third value. It is mandatory if the significantly different between the two values. Like example, uh, value X, there is a 10 lakh, uh, one crore rupees has come fair value and value or two, there is a two crores, then significantly different, 100% different or one crore 50 lakhs, 50% different, the RP shall appoint third value. And once the RP gets the third valuation, he has to do the average of two 
closest values estimates as a final value, whether it is a liquidation value or fair value. And again, at the time of liquidation, it is the liquidator's responsibility or liquidator feels that the valuation is required, then he will appoint the values again. Otherwise, the liquidator can take the own, uh, whatever he got during CRP process, the same values can be taken over. Yeah, what are the assets to be covered under IBC valuation? Uh, all assets should be covered, land and building and plant and missionary. In the case of land and building and plant and missionary, the resolution professional will appoint respect to uh, valuers. And we have to, whatever the assets are available in the balance sheet side, capital work in progress, intangibles, non-current investments, inventory, receivables, loans and advances, other current assets, all assets shall be valued under IBC. Whether it is doing by the land and building value or plant and missionary, or securities or financial assets. There are challenges where land and building value or plant and missionary value will say that this is not our scope. That has to be discussed with resolution professional or other values and we have to sort out. And importance of valuation. This valuation is to whom it is important. It is important for resolution professional as per IBC process, he has to get the fair value and liquidation value as a commencement of date of CRP. And it is required for committee of creditors also because the committee of creditors will receive the resolution plan from the resolution applicant where they have to take that decision. This is very, very important. Based on your value only, the resolution plan will be approved. For example, if you give more value, then the resolution plan may not, the resolution plan may, may not be success. It will be failure. Then company will go to liquidation. That is the reason like we have to give the correct value, realizable value, because as a resolution applicant, even I, I, I won't give much more value unless there is a value is there, realizable value is there. It is important to committee of creators as well as resolution applicant, because whenever the resolution applicant also, once he submit, because he will submit law, deposit amount to the uh, corporate debtor, then it is also very, very important to the resolution applicant as well as to the liquidator, because once comes, company comes to the liquidation, then he has to decide whether he can go to the CRP valuation or he has to appoint new values again during the liquidation. That's why it's very, very important uh, for all CRP process, the valuation. And here, what is the fair value? The fair value has been defined by IBBA regulations. It is an estimated realizable value of the assets of the corporate data. It is the estimated what is the realizable value. If they were to be exchanged on the insolvency commencement date, here uh, everybody has to see what is the on the insolvency commencement date only we have to see what is the realizable value. For example, if the insolvency started on 1st April or 20th March, we have to see value can be arrived on the date. And between a willing buyer and willing seller in an arm's length transaction, and we need not to see any related party transactions. Willing buyer, they should be a buyer and seller again. Just like that, if you give the market value, for their example, there are land and building. If you give the market value, there may not be willing buyer because of due to different uh, reasons. Maybe under text or there is maybe under uh, uh, some statutory obligations, willing buyer will not be coming. That's what we have to see, willing buyer and willing seller after proper marketing and where parties had acted knowledgeably, prudently and without compulsion. This is the fair value. We have to keep in mind, as a value, we have to keep in mind whether this will go, uh, there will be a willing buyer or willing seller will be there. But arms and transactions, we need to see. This is very, very important, fair value. Liquidation value, again, uh, they have given very small definition here. The estimated realizable value of the assets of the corporate debtor, if the corporate debtor were to be liquidated. See, in the fair value, the company will be ongoing, uh, going concern concept. Uh, like you can see the value of the assets or you can approach, you can do sometimes discounted cash flow method also in DCF uh, for arriving the fair value. But the liquidation value, uh, we have to see the estimated realizable value if the assets you are going to sell liquidated. 
again liquidation again you can sell uh, piecemeal basis or lump sum or ongoing concern basis also we can do we have to see all those things liquidation value yeah and what is the valuation process here we have to do the planning the purpose you know the purpose is to arrive the fair value as well as the liquidation value as a commencement date for ibc purpose and the planning how we have to do we have to collect the data what is the data we have to collect first we have to collect last two years of the balance sheet as well as solvency commencement date balance sheet also we have to collect and what are the asset classes we need to see and we need to have discussion with the resolution professional whether they appointed any plant investor land and billing and what are the assets and we need to have a lot of discussion with the resolution professional if it is required we can discuss with the corporate data also like promoters or directors of the company this has to be very planned before starting your process then once you have all the data once you have whatever the data supplied by resolution professional because why i am mentioning all the data sometimes resolution professional cannot give all the data also because he will not be having because they will be preparing whatever the data you can we have and you can do some inspection through uh, mc also you can download all the documents and we have to start inspection physical site visit it is very very important during the pandemic like uh, as a valuers we have taken some uh, uh, exemption but whereas uh, physical site visit is uh, mandatorily because you will be seeing whether company is there or not list of is there or not whether assets inventory is existing or not don't believe by taking the photos because sometimes they'll share photos of last time photos or last year photos like that we have to see the current and also we have to take all photos when you visit any of this uh, uh, site visit you have to take photos along with the resolution of professional or promoters you have to take all the photos and you have to keep it as a documentary evidence and again you have to do some market survey whether uh, this much will be uh, can we can sell it or there will be a willing buyer or not without willing buyer if you give just market rate there may be some guidance value will be there or market rate will be different or due to some restrictions uh, the asset may not be sold all those things we have to see market survey and analysis value drivers everything we have to apply while doing your valuation again report the report also we have to uh, include all the important things as per our uh, uh, ibba or companies act says okay uh, what are the report contents we have to keep everything what are the methods you have applied what are the basis you have taken whether you got information from the resolution professional or not for each asset we have to explain how you treated trade data how you treated inventory if trade data are so, whether aging analysis you have carried out or not <laughs> Can any balance confirmations or not? Everything, uh, and we have to take opinion from the uh, resolution professional as well as the corporate debtor. All those things we have to take. We have to incorporate in the report. Just like that, we can't say that trade receivables. There is a uh, insolvency commencement date. There is a three crores, and just you can give two crores. For two crores receivable, what is the basis you have? Whether you have any received balance confirmation, aging analysis you have received, and even you can collect tally also from the uh, resolution professional. All those things we have to see. You can also analyze because sometimes the resolution professional may not be uh, sharing all the data, but as a company secretary or CA or CWA, you will be having the, the analysis uh, uh, how how to analyze the balance sheet, and you can analyze and you can talk to the resolution professional. Even in a few cases. we spoke to the corporate debtor like directors of the company for each uh, uh, debtor wise whether you can collect or not if you collect you get can we get the balance confirmation or not and when they have sold it before insolvency or after insolvency those things everything we have to see and we have to get information from uh, the corporate debtor as well as insol resolution professional and we have to prepare the report because tomorrow if any coc they will talk on all this report only and when you are preparing the report you can prepare only your securities or finance assets report only previously uh, before guideline ibb guideline we used to attach uh, as an example of land and building and plant and machinery now it is not required you need not include any of your sfa you can give your own report for securities or finance assets and documents required as an crp commencement date a detailed list of inventory including both raw material finished goods and semi finished goods whatever is available we have to collect the inventory and list of loans and advances with agreements purpose and related parties details 
and insolvency commencement date financials and non current investments uh, stating their purposes agreements or any for example uh, they have any fixed deposit with a bank then we need to collect the fixed deposit uh, receipt also because the balance sheet may be showing it, they might have again uh, withdrawal that is the reason we have to collect all those things if belong, if any shares are invested into the other companies unquoted private limited companies or listed companies we have to collect those share certificates all are important things without having proof we cannot give any value because if they don't have the proof tomorrow it cannot be realizable and there won't be any willing buyer that is the reason proofs are very very important here as a value okay getting uh, the assignment okay we want to get the ibc assignment but once we get the ibc assignment okay uh, of doing that execution of ibc valuation is very very difficult because you have all challenges from corporate data as well as the resolution professional again they will say that i have only this data and you please complete uh, with this data only the valuation yeah. these are the minimum uh, documents required for doing uh, your ibc valuation and the challenges like you will have you, as ibc valuer will be having different challenges like valuation of inventory then it will be decided okay sometimes the plant and machinery will say that the inventory is not belongs to plant and machinery as a securities or financial assets you have to do the valuation of inventory then uh, some cases like maybe you will be having like huge like manufacturing companies then you have to see the raw material finished goods semi finished goods maybe you you may not be having that expert then you have to appoint a few other experts who can do the inventory valuation then you have to rely on that and the valuation of investment in subsidiaries also like where the corporate debtor is invested in subsidiaries which the uh, shares are not listed it is a private limited company and you have to value those investments again how to get the dcf from the other company as net asset value method we have to use it and you have to download all those subsidiaries data from mca and the valuation of loans and advances given to directors traded parties and employees whether it is realizable or not because the fair value means it is a realizable value the val the loans given to the employees the employees may not be there in the company as an insolvency commencement date if employees are there whether we will get it back or not that is also a question and directors also directors also if you ask again the intern they will say that already we have given loan to the company some 10 crores and what are taken is 2 crores only company only has to give 8 crores amount to us and even we have submission claim to the resolution professional also then how you decide whether the amount will come or not and again the resolution professional will say that we have filed a fraudulent transaction on the directors we will get this amount okay you will be in a situation you cannot decide whether the amount is realizable or not whereas you have to give because as a process uh, the resolution professional also has to complete within 180 days then again it is a problem and they will also put pressure okay to provide the report whether it is realizable or not you decide the rp will say that you decide with your knowledge whether it is realizable or not this is the facts and valuation of trade receivables this is very very important like last three to four years or two years maybe it is not receivable can you realize as a uh, insolvency professional i can realize that this trade receivables are not then valuation of deposits with the statutory authorities whether it is realizable or not like with the bescom or with uh, uh, any statute of income tax or sales tax the deposits and the valuation of intangible assets is very very important whether we can we have to do brand valuation or not very what are the amount showing intangible assets can we give some value or not and availability of information latest financial statements and projections and valuation of residuary assets other than land and building plant and machinery as a securities or financial assets valuer you have to take care of all assets that's what resolution professional will expect from you because they will say that land and building value and plant and machinery this is the only as a residuary assets you have to do as a sfa because even in our ibba or in our company sac it is not defined so uh, what are the assets belong to securities or financial assets and one more challenge is support from the resolution professional also because sometimes the resolution professional himself will say that uh, you go and contact the chartered accountant or you go and contact the direct sub company promoters like we have to get support and before taking any assignment under ibc valuation we need to see all this okay even we will see that if the resolution professional is going to be cooperative or be, then only we will uh, accept the assignment otherwise accepting the assignment and uh, not giving the results properly 
and sometimes he will also complain to ibba there are situations where resolution professional also complained on valuers because they are not giving the data like these are the different challenges we have to see that and all we will discuss during the panel discussion yeah thank you uh, no i request thank you subarab yeah sure yeah thank you subarab uh, for uh, taking us through a overview of uh, the various uh, challenges uh, faced by valuers so you you explained you know what uh, what are the steps we will be following what are the standards we will be applying how to what are the inclusions and exclusions in the report finally you touched upon certain individual items in the uh, during the course of valuation so i would uh, like uh, mr ankit goel to <coughs> to explain <coughs> in detail how inventory valuation is done in the context of uh, uh, ibc over to you mr ankit goel good morning everyone uh, uh, good to see all of you uh, uh, all up for uh, you know this session in the morning and i'm looking forward to a very learning session because a lot of homework has been done on collecting questions and i believe all of you will be very active throughout these two hours that we are spending already uh ibc valuation has a lot of questions and i believe that we will try and answer those questions together today uh the inventory valuation part that sir has mentioned uh it's a tricky part because of some customs and history of how inventory has been valued or who has been valuing inventory in our country so far and uh, if you talk about inventory inventory normally in the balance sheet of a company is part of the current assets or you know the uh, financial assets of a company part of a working capital of the company as you can say and traditionally a chartered accountant or a company secretary is the person who is hired by the bankers to do a stock audit or do an inventory verification exercise for this stock traditionally also it is expected from a statutory auditor to have a basic understanding and do a stock count Uh, at the end of the year, at right, the financial year for a company. Now, uh, taking a stock count, doing a valuation. When a chartered accountant does that valuation, he normally has uh, the book values with him. He normally has uh, the cost with him. And uh, when he does, he doesn't need a really, really need a market study. Other than you know to have a look at that, that whatever are the products that. maybe are being manufactured out of some raw material or some wip some finished goods they are sellable in the market that's what he is trying to find out he is looking for obsolescence uh, he is looking for those goods which are damaged or rejected that is the primary idea of a uh, chartered accountant that is what entails his duties as an auditor as a uh, auditor uh, for as a statutory auditor or as a bank auditor so uh, when it comes to uh, when we come to our Place where we say that okay, we say that okay. There are three asset classes now. There's a land building, there's a plant and machinery, and there is a uh, SFA. Now, in that circumstance, there are certain circumstances when the inventory will become the part of or job of the land building value or the P and M value, and uh, especially in case of say real estate companies where there is a project under development, a real estate project, maybe uh, somebody is into the trading of land and building. so in those situations you will find the uh, uh, you will find that the values of uh, those inventories are um, uh, including uh, the uh, some land building is part of that inventory of the company and that is where the valuation uh, i believe is required or should be ideally done by land and building valuer because that person will be or that person has the expertise in the land and building asset class and therefore he will do he will be able to do more a better job out of it similarly wherever there is say machinery spare and spares parts uh, uh, which are uh, otherwise difficult to be understood by an sfa valuer some places where volumetric analysis is required when i say volumetric analysis i say that the plant and machinery valuer is normally understood to uh, or or expected to have the expertise of looking at something and try to determine or try to know or try to understand what is it made of what is the metal that goes into making that what would be the kind of weight that machinery would have so this analysis also helps the 
process of understanding you know scrap value at times because in case i say that the scrap value can be determined who would do a better better valuation with respect to valuing scrap out of you know just seeing a plant in machinery because in most circumstances where we work in ibc valuations we don't have the measures to you know uh, do something with that machinery lift it or weigh it or you know separate it out of the uh, uh, the place where it is installed that is not available what is available is somebody's experience that okay what is the typical uh, weight of this kind of a machinery based on its cost based on based on the metals that go into it so i'm saying that wherever the stock also requires such volumetric analysis it should ideally be the plant and machinery valuer who might be able to do a better job than an sfa valuer in valuing those inventories so that's with respect to inventories and uh, i think i can make a few points few more points in the time that is available with me before we uh, uh, move on with the uh, other schedule now one of the most popular questions i believe which will be available or which will be of the audience is how do you get an ibc valuation assignment because in case i uh, 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 notice correctly uh, a significant number of uh, uh, valuers had not done a single ibc valuation now it is very easy to find uh, that somebody has been appointed an irp in some case and uh, that is something that is a very very important information that is available in public forum on ibbi website that whenever any case goes into insolvency or any case goes into liquidation it is a mandatory requirement for the rp resolution professional uh, in in some in irp or the liquidator in interim resolution professional or the liquidator to to put out a public notice and tell everyone that please give me your claims at that point in time you know that okay some case has gone into crp or some case has gone into liquidation and the date of uh, uh, the order of the nclt which takes that company to insolvency is also available in that public notice and the act is very clear that uh, the valuer is required to be appointed within 47 days from the crp commencement date so now you have somebody uh, you have the name of the person who has been appointed in the case you have the date on which the case uh, has started and you have normally in case you find that person online you will also try to, you will find that the email address of that person is already part of that public notice the mobile number is also available normally in public domain now it becomes uh, uh, it is up to you that how far do you want to go in trying to pursue that rp and persuade him tell him about your experience tell him about your industry experience tell him about how you will do a good job with respect to that valuation and try to develop faith and a uh, 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 connection that you will do a good job and then get an rfq request for quotation from the rp the request from quotation in most circumstances will uh, include a balance sheet because by 47th day of the crp commencement date the rp normally the irp normally knows very little about the business you understand you need to understand that the promoters may not be cooperating they may not be giving any information they may not be giving books of accounts so the rp most probably does an roc search finds out whatever balance sheet is last available online it can be 2015 uh, seven years old balance sheet it can be 2020 it can be 2022 it can be anything but most probably in most cases it would be in, in today in 22 we are trying to find out a balance sheet 21 most probably will not be filed so we'll either get 21 20 19 and so on so you will get these kind of balance sheets those balance sheets will have a list of assets you will see some large amounts there uh and uh, you will uh, the uh, the uh, the the rp can also find the charges from the mca website uh, and then can understand that what all assets are mortgaged for the loans taken by the company and wherever the loans are uh, wherever the mortgaged assets are belonging to the company you can try and find out the title for the company for with respect to those those properties or those items uh and that is the information that the rp can supply to the valuer at the time of the rfq based on which uh, and based on the competition uh, the uh, rp requires the valuers to give a quote um, the coc normally the committee of creditors which 
uh, to which the RP is in a way reporting to, which is also, you know, the first 30 days of an IRP being appointed in a case, the IRP is also trying to retain his seat. So the IRP is trying to find out uh, that, okay, what will be the fee at which the bankers will be willing to continue working with him for that CIRP? What are the value of the assets which are available underlying in case there is a company where there is no asset at all? then what is the point of any valuation, forensic audit? What is the point of continuing the RP process? And the most important question there is, where will the money come from? Because in case the RP is expected to work for six months, one year, whatever the time it takes, um, he will expect some remuneration. Somebody has to pay that remuneration. And if there is no asset or nothing belonging to the company which can be realized to pay the creditors, then the creditors normally would say that, no, we are not interested. And the RP would also then understand that this is a very small case where I will not get too much money and the valuation exercise can be completely abandoned. There can be a stay, there can be other things that come in between. But coming to the point, uh, there's a lot of competition that you have to uh, match your fee. The COC is price sensitive. They will like L1. They will not be concerned whether you are uh, you have experience of 100 cases you have, or you have no experience at all. That is the job of the RP to identify and find out and make sure that you know the valuation report that he gets done is something that is not will not cause a problem for the whole process and for him to uh, also uh, you know get that case closed at the earliest. So that is the process that uh, I would say is available uh, for all people who want to uh, take up an IRP or take up a uh, CRP case or a liquidation case for valuation. Then it comes that what is the responsibility of the RP in providing details? So in most cases, what happens is that the RP uh, is, you know, trying to find that, okay, what is the, uh, where will the uh, details of the assets come from? So let's say there is a land and building and a plant and machinery. Now, say land and building, you can see that, okay, what all the information required to value that asset? Somebody who is buying that land and building in a normal market scenario would say that, okay, I will uh, like to have the title deed of the land. I would like to have the cost of construction of that building when it was constructed. I would like to have some kind of a plan, a building plan, which was followed when the building was constructed. I want to know whether there is a completion certificate taken by the taken for the building completion or not. I want to understand if the building is really sanctioned or not. The, the construction is sanctioned or not. Uh, so there can be so many so many questions that a valuer might have uh, or a RP might have with respect to any asset that he is trying to market in the and trying to find a find a buyer or trying to find a resolution applicant who will then be interested in using that land and building. So similarly, plant and machinery, you would normally expect, you know, a plant and machinery value would say, I need the description of the machinery. I need who, who is the, who, what make is it? I would like to have the date on which it was uh, manufactured, the date on which it was installed in the current premises. What is the uh, maintenance record of that plant and machinery in the past? How often was that used? Because you might find that physically there is a very, very big machine lying out there but it might be totally useless because it can't be calibrated or there is a serious problem in that machinery because of which you will not be able to operate that machine. In most sites that we have gone to, there is not even electricity connection uh, to, you know, to, uh, to switch on the lights, leave alone electricity connection available to test a machinery. So these are the difficulties that you find. But the question now is that what is the information that the RP is required to provide? So the answer to that would be that the RP is required to provide whatever information he can fetch because it is the duty of the RP to collect as much information as possible to get the due diligence done for the uh, resolution plan uh, coming in for that, for that uh, company or for sale under liquidation. Because in case the RP is trying to sell an asset or trying to get a resolution plan without this information, you imagine that the marketability for that asset will, will then be very poor. Only those people will be interested in that property or in that land and building where they are trying to or they will get hold of that information automatically. So because of that inherent duty of the RP, the RP is required to get as much information as possible with respect to that land and building, plant and machinery, whatever assets 
and then try to realize them. This is the, uh, the this information is what is required to be passed on to the valuer for the valuer to then give his independent assessment with respect to those values. Yeah, Ankit, here one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. At the time of accepting the assignment itself, the valuer has to check with the resolution professional who is going to the valuation of inventory, whether it is planned missionary or uh, the SFA valuer. Otherwise, okay, there will be again discussion after appointing. Because yes, it can be it can be discussed, but then the only problem there which I find is that at that point in time, in case the RP himself doesn't know what is the nature of inventory, how will he say that okay, who will do it? Hmm. So no, that's the only at, problem. No, at least the at least okay, the RP might have visited the factory and okay, the balance sheet he will be having and he can I, see the my, my estimate is that in 75% of the cases, the RP may not have visited the factory on the 47th day of the CRP day. Correct. Yes. Yes. So that's that's the problem that you know in case of non-cooperating promoters, uh, yes. the RP may not have the information to decide who should ideally do the inventory. Correct. And when you are but the only the point, yeah, and and the other other the and the other fact is and the other other issue is that in case uh, the RP decides that okay the PM value will do the valuation because how it becomes a, also creates some synergy is that the PM value is required to physically inspect the assets Correct. and uh, the physical inspection is required for the fixed assets and the inventories the sfa value it is normally understood would not be required to do the to visit the factory and to understand because there's nothing there that he can see he can't see trade receivables there he can't see you know uh, cash and bank balances there all that is document based so it becomes some kind of a synergy for the uh, plant and machinery value to also look at the inventory lying there because normally, wherever you know you will find significant inventory, the inventory will be in a way mixed up with the plant and machinery. Now, yeah. I will give you an example that we did a valuation where we were valuing a company which was into uh, retailing the uh, retailing home appliance product, pro products. Now, in this kind of a scenario, the home appliance products can be valued by an SFA value as well as a PM value. Because end of the day, the required uh, understanding is to find that is that uh, okay is that microwave oven a plant and machinery or a uh, or a uh, or an inventory now it can be a plant and machinery if it is part of your fixed assets but at the same time what i'm trying to say is that in certain cases it becomes synergy synergy is there in the plant and machinery visiting the site and doing the valuation for both the pnm and the inventory thank you sometimes this space should be like capital space and uh, now we current space now with capital space as space which come along with capital asset so how do you make a distinction between them? Which is a is it inventory or is it a capital asset? Uh, capital inventory. Uh, so uh, I didn't Normally understand. What, sir, which which assets are you talking about, sir? So supposing you have a big machine which is coming along mm -hmm. with that, no, along the supplier himself will give certain spares to be used in the first year, spares, second year, okay. kind of a thing. So spares in case the so in case the spares are coming in and the spares are uh, part of my inventory. Uh, so financially or accounting point of view in case the spares are coming in along with that machinery i would try and put those spares in inventory and try and carve out those values and see okay and try to you know uh, write them off or charge them to pnl whenever they are uh, spent or used because there might be certain life for certain spares uh, but uh, uh, it, they, they would perhaps be in inventory in most circumstances they will not be capitalized as uh, if if they are not put to use, I, so, I will give an example. I will give an example, Ankit, mm -hmm. uh, where okay, we have done one valuation. It is an oil company. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of like seeds, rice with them. Like the mm -hmm. rice, okay, like rice. Mm -hmm. Then the SFA has to be uh, done the valuation as per my view because planted missionary cannot do the rice valuation. Yeah, uh, very so difficult I, to say that the rice, the planted mm -hmm. machinery, very difficult and. Uh, uh, yeah, it should widely be done then, then by the SFA value. You're right. Correct. Correct. And even therefore the are... so therefore the nature of the inventory is important to understand that who should ideally do that. And in some circumstances where it is not clear uh, and it, it becomes clear later, then the scope of work can change accordingly. Yes. Okay. Even if it is a hotel industry where there are livestock, then we have to do the valuation as SFA. The sheep or hen or something like that. 
live stock yeah yes there the uh, that live stock is part of the inventories it it is it doesn't fit into land and building or plant and machinery anyways yes okay uh, uh, thank you uh, mr gwell okay on the subject of uh, uh, inventory valuation which, which uh, mr ravi shankar was uh, referring to i can uh, relate to the steel industry you know the the roles in the steel industry which which is part of uh, equipment but which also has you know a three month life six month life so you have to keep replacing the uh, role also so the role is both uh, an inventory and uh, a part of fixed assets depending on uh, which way you look at it normally two roles or three roles come with the with the equipment and uh, gradually it will, they get worn out and you keep uh, replacing uh, those roles so there is a temptation there to, you know to fix uh, to to uh, put the roles as a part of fixed assets to hide you know uh, the true profit and loss account and all the fudging happens there so it is i don't know how the valuation of uh, inventory will be done whether it is part of fixed assets to value or whether it's part of the inventory valuation can be dicey in i don't know how you solve that so my, my reading there is that this kind of a role when it is very important to understand technically whether that role is a used one or an unused one and that knowledge is something which is very difficult to be expected from an sfa valuer uh, and maybe somebody who is uh, a technical expert and has an understanding of how steel industry works will be a better person to judge that and that that i think element makes me think that maybe a pnm valuer would be a better person to do that valuation okay uh, okay mr goel uh, it has been uh, you know very useful uh, uh, hearing from you so you took us through the traditional roles of uh, ca most of us here are uh, uh, ca is not uh, land and building or plant and machinery uh, valuers so you you took us through situations like you know in the real estate valuation where you know the entire house is inventory so whether what what will a ca do in uh, such uh, valuations so then you know you took us through the scrap value of uh, the plant and machinery which is very important to to understand what information rp can and should provide to the uh, rv so uh, what is the expectation of uh, uh, what should be the expectation of rv from uh, rp and finally you know the mixing up of uh, the fixed assets with uh, inventory was uh, covered so i now uh, request mr ravi shankar to go on the next important uh, uh, item of uh, valuation which is rather controversial is uh, valuation of uh, things like advances and uh, debtors in the uh, balance sheet of uh, the corporate debtor so with this uh, few words i hand over to mr ravi shankar good morning gentlemen uh, so i have been a rp i have also a risk value and at the same time i did small cases and big cases also so as an rp and a value so that gives me a more understanding of what are the problems from the rp side at the same time what are the problems from a value side and what are the expense expectations for a small company expectation from big company the normally the advantage of a large company is that they have a full record a cfo a company secretary and a full setup will be there and the balance sheet will have been done till latest that means almost up to 20 year 22 that is 25 march also would have been filed because it's a regular large company with a full uh, team of uh, financing staff and all that so in those kind of cases you will get the required data so sf as a sfa valuer more as uh, shankit goel was saying that most of our data is available online or in the balance sheet only if it is not there it is not there that's a different issue but first uh, what we do the sfa is, as a part of the valuation report itself is there we need to know our scope so while asking the scope only we should ask you whether inventory is in our scope or inventory is in the plant and machinery scope so that we uh, because even the uh, international valuation standards also require that we should mention the scope of our work in our report 
So for for the SFA contains normally the standard uh, things that are available in the balance sheet is the first is the receivables. Receivables is the toughest thing because a company goes into insolvency mainly because of the receivables not coming on time. If the receivables come on time and uh, payments happen on time, the working capital is regularly managed and then there's no problem. But when the you have to make the payments regularly, but you can't make them because your receivables are stuck. So in that case, I see many companies with a large amount of receivables. So first thing required for us as a registered manager is that sometimes the value the receivables are pending for more than three years, four years also. Sometimes they from group companies also. So there now we need to take a confirmation balance. If the company is regularly taking the confirmation balances, that can be depend, depended upon. Otherwise, you know, as a value, we need to write the those parties. But most of the times you don't have the mail ID or lay address also in the company. So, but such a case also we. If there's nothing available, I've seen reports. In fact, uh, when I was doing a SF evaluation, I was asking for confirmation balances. If this is not there, then we'll simply say not available. So, and then valuation will be nil to such cases. But if uh, the, the management still feels, and then we also take a management undertaking as to whether they are realizable in their view at least. Sometimes they say it's not realizable. So we can record like that. But if the management says that they are still realizable, then we need to give a weightage. Say about uh, if it is the first 10 to less than 30 days old, then we can 100% we can take it face value. If it is say 61 to 90 days, some 2% we should reduce. If it is more than one year, 100% you can uh, write our uh, reduce from the value. So like that, now we can have a table of length of the outstanding due based on which how much discount you want to give the to the value. So that kind of a thing we can plan. And then that is also acceptable. I've seen some cases where they do this kind of a table and then do it uh, uh, simply. Okay, so that's one way of handling the receivables issue. So first we'll say that it, whether it's as per the balance sheet or not, then whether it's receivable or not. If the management feels that if it's receivable and depending on the length of the outstanding period, we can give an appropriate discount for the valuation. Then, uh, then there'll be other juice, other advances, like electricity deposit, just, uh, then deposit with the society and all that, or water deposit kind of things. Normally in this kind of a insolvency companies, what happens is that the company will not be in a position to pay those electricity juice also. So if the juice, there are electricity juice, ideally as per IBC, electricity department should give a claim. And this deposit, what is showing in the asset side is like a uh, asset to be recovered from outside. But normally that does not happen because especially electricity or government juice, no, they legist it. So I seen in RP also I seen it. We wrote, we write to the electricity department saying that you are not eligible to claim the old juice because IBC does not provide for all that, but they don't accept it. So as a valuer, what we did do is that if there is any due to the electricity at this type, the statutory departments, uh, government departments and all that, we can say that those deposits are not realizable. So that is what we do for it. The deposits of a government juice kind of thing when they are there. Then you'll have long term loans like loans and advances, like staff advances or old balances. So, staff advances, I've seen many people, many companies where there are staff advances and the staff are not in the roles of the company anymore. So, those kind of things we should write up. Then we also have investments and loans, and loans advance given to associates and subsidiaries, especially investments and subsidiaries and associate companies. Uh, I have seen, in my experience, we have seen companies where uh, one main company is in this insolvency and all its associated subsidiaries are anyway doing bad only. So when we did the valuation of these investments in that, so we take the balance sheets of those companies, do a valuation. Normally, they are all uh, either a negative network or the shares in those companies are pledged for the loans taken by the parent company. So in which case also, the valuation for such shares will be nil. If the company is doing bad, again, it is nil. So if both of them are not there, that means the shares are not rich and there's a value, residual value to the uh, this uh, uh, holding company, then you can assign some value to that. Otherwise, normally investments in associates and subsidies will also be 19% cases will be nil loan. Then the third one, last one is the inventory, which we've been discussing. So one is if the inventory is in the scope of SFA value, then he again compulsorily has to go for site visit. One more advent, one more document what we can talk of is that normally bank companies are supposed to sub submit the bank statement, okay, quarterly or half yearly kind of returns to the banks. If they're submitting, it's good. If they're not submitting also, after what date they are submitted, that also you can take it so that you know the data available aside 
and the information given to the banks. So based on that, you can arrive at a conclusion. Then you'll have a cash and bank balances. Cash balance, normally RPs will say that I didn't receive any cash, because though the cash will show say one lakh, two lakhs, 99% cases, RP will not get any such cash. But you take information from the RP saying whether he got a cash balance or not. If it is not there, nil value. If he says he has got some cash, then that is the value. Similarly, bank balance is anyway recorded. So you can take the bank statement based on which you can take the bank balances. Then comes the income tax refunds. There will be GST, GST carry forward, uh, GST input credit, and income tax refunds. These kind of things will be there in the balance sheet. If it is a going concern, GST set input credit will have value that we can take at face value. If it is a liquidation stage, GST of input anyway, you can't use for anything. So that will be uh, nil value, liquidation value will be nil loan. Similarly, income tax refunds, you have to see the assessment orders. Are they up to what time the assessments are complete? If the assessments are complete till recently, then the income tax refund, you can expect it back. But if the assessments are not complete, then 90% chance that that income tax refund is just on paper only, it will not come. Then third, then one more issue, what I did, I have seen in the some cases that, in fact, recently also I was seeing one case where the valuation reports given by the valuers were not accepted by NCLT. The NCLT said that uh, we don't accept this valuation report to get a fresh valuation done once again. So the RP had to again appoint. And in fact, the NCLT in that case, in what the case I'm referring to, they directed, they appointed two advocates from the uh, court hall to appoint two values and get the fresh valuations done. So if the valuation report is not reasonable or not acceptable to the NCLT, even though COC has accepted it, but if it is not acceptable to NCLT, they can appoint a fresh value. So that problem will be there, which will be a bad remark. There is no bad remark for a value on that, but it looks odd for saying that we have done valuation, COC has accepted it, but NCLT is not accepted. So those kind Mr. of cases are also... Mr. Yes. Mr. Ravishankar, one... Uh, can you just brief on the circumstances in which NCLT rejected the evaluation and the specifics of that case? Sir, uh, the case... The case I'm referring to is the Galada Telecommunications. That is the case. Actually, I noted down the name also. Okay. Uh, Galada is a hydroid bench. So what happened in that case is uh, what happened exactly in the order also I'm saying. What I'm say, uh, what uh, said was that the judges are both from Hyderabad. Okay. It, and then there is some land in the building, land in there, then some planting machine, everything was there in the company. Okay. It's not for the SFA value problem, but it is basically the land valuation problem. So the judges said that we are from Hyderabad. So we know the entire circumstances and topography of Hyderabad very well. So definitely this land would have been valued at a higher price. And uh, since the valuation was done at a lower price, the RAs gave a lesser price. So RAs did not know the valuation, but COC accepted a lower uh, plan because the valuation was less, because the benchmark was at a lower level. That's what the NCLT felt. And NCLT directed two of the advocates present in that hall to appoint two more values and then five submit the report to the NCL. So then the report, revised report, the new report also was submitted to NCLT, but it is at that stage now. So what happened to the plan that will be knowing only, I think the next hearing is somewhere next month. Somewhere. So in the process, what happened is that though plan was submitted somewhere in uh, September, October, ideally we thought that October plan was submitted to NCLT with COC 100% approval. By November, we'll get the approval, but then it went into this loop. In fact, uh, the NCLT judge also shouted at the RP saying that you didn't take a proper care in getting the proper valuation because the RP was from Bombay. So he doesn't know anything about Hyderabad. But since judges were from Hyderabad, they felt that the valuation is totally uh, at a lower end. And that's how the RAs got a cheaper. Uh, uh, okay. <coughs> so that was the issue. <coughs> But as I said, it is more, it's not a SFA issue, but it's more of a land and building issue. But uh, the RVs should be, values should be careful, saying that whatever they're doing, even if it is COC approved, it's not that uh, end of whole thing. Then you'll have certain other off balance sheets also, yes. items also in the balance sheet, in the valuation. Like in one of our companies, no, it had a, then, okay, then one more thing I wanted to give is that deposits. Normally, there will be no deposits left in a bank, in a, which is an IBC. But there will be, if there is a bank guarantee issued, then the, all these deposits will be a security for that bank guarantee. Now, there are two ways of seeing it. 
there are there are judgments which say that a, a bank cannot set off its liability to clear the deposit there are some judgments like that in which case the deposit has to be valued at face, uh, face value or the, including along with the accrued interest but then i have seen some banks which encash the uh, they, they, they just the deposit in the day one only and they give a claim for uh, without the bank guarantee which means that they are actually encashing their margin money so because they, they know that once they are the deposit is given in the company they will get only share of it in the uh, section 53 along with other lenders they have to share it so what they do is that they will just the deposit immediately and then give a claim only for lesser money in that case the valuation while doing the valuation the deposit should not be considered for our but normally the the deposits for against bank guarantee margin money are not considered for valuation purpose then similarly you have some customs deposits so if there are claims against the customs department then again you don't take this uh, customs deposit into account so it will be a nil valuation only then uh, okay then i said uh, this uh, off balance sheet items so there will be some off balance sheet items like in one of our company the company had a pre qualification for uh, large projects because the company was a large one they were they are actually implementing large projects so there are people who are willing to take over the company because the pre qualification the, that the company had but once the company went into liquidation that pre qualifications meant nothing because the company was anyway to go into dissolution at later stage and their pre qualifications whatever are there they would have uh, uh, become nil so the liquidation value for that was again nil so this is my experience and uh, what i did as i said i had to do small cases where there was nothing in the company and uh, where we said that even valuation is also waste so in fact i suggested the rp to go directly for go to nclt saying that there is no money in the company even to pay the value of 1000 rupees also so go directly into resolution so from crp 22 resolution directly that was the case where in valuation nothing was done and uh, this is what i had to say so handout from one question is is there um, then how do you assess you know you you at the beginning of the uh, your uh, uh, session you you highlighted that you know you classify debtors based on length of outstanding okay whether it is uh, 30 days 60 days 60 days you need to the age way age way analysis you do age way age way analysis confirmation of balance is available I mean unless there is a confirmation of balance the, the, what is the sanctity of uh, <clears throat> i have never seen a confirmation of balance in any carp because the debtor also knows that the company has gone insolvent there is a, he knows that you know his money is as good as uh, not repayable so that's true so that's why no rv also has to try to then okay see if the management see there are two ways of seeing it again certain managements okay most of our companies are now smes because of the increased level in the sme level so the earlier is only 20 crores 30 crores kind of a thing now up to 250 crores turnover also it is sme so most of the companies that we do normally will become smes where the promoter only can bid for the company again in which case the objective of the promoter will be to show a lesser value of the Uh, this uh, value of the decision so that he can bid for the company and take it okay so if they are, so in that sense the promoter's intention is not to give data to you so that you give a nil value to every receivable and then make the valuation as low as possible so that he can easily bid and take it but we should not get into that trap so if even the promoter is not giving you have two three balance sheets you can compare with that suppose they suddenly the data goes up so today we're in 22 march so 20 2020 march only the data figure has gone up that means it's only 2 year old so that kind of analysis we have to do with it we can't just rely on what the management is saying that's what i want to say but if they as i said if they genuinely the data are more than 3 4 years and there is no balance sheet only for 4 4 years then yes the value will be nil because we are always as a rv we always do a conservative valuation we don't do a higher valuation than what is there so i think raghupati is having a question raghupati yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, see, sir. Regarding the deposits, actually, see all the deposits, sir. For example, rental deposits or the some things like things. The if we take the realizable value as nil, see it is available for reducing some liability. Actually, there why not we take this as a realizable? Ah, uh, 
sir sir can you repeat Hello? again your voice is not audible can you repeat i believe sir's question is with respect to rent security so sir is saying in case of an asset like a rent security how do you value that asset and uh, that that's what sir is uh, trying to ask because especially there when there is a, a liability to be set yeah, off there is a possibility that so sorry uh, i was uh, logged off for some point i don't know when i got logged off uh, please proceed yeah yes uh, sir ragupati sir that in that case what we have to see even the deposit if any rent due is there again it, it is nothing but a trade data are okay again yeah. the rent has to be uh, the rent has to be paid by the corporate data in few cases what we do is okay we will do the minus of that the deposit and we will give the value if there is no due then we okay. can take as a asset if already there is a due towards rent then uh, obviously the owner will not give the tamo to the company then we don't treat as a asset we don't treat it it might be like releasable value uh ankit maybe oh. you were going to you can give on that no i agree so in most circumstances at the juncture where these companies come into insolvency they have some rent outstandings the rent is because not paying rent is one of the first things that a defaulting company does uh they would uh, stop paying rent because it is very easy to do that it is very difficult to move out a person who is not paying rent from your premises uh the other thing i want to add is that as sir was saying with respect to receivables uh i we we normally look at that uh, at valuing receivables with respect to two uh, different sides of the same thing one is we we see recoverability we say and the other thing is of course the accuracy of that balance now do both these things are important so we have had cases where somebody was willing to confirm a balance of 15 crore rupees he said that yes i i have 15 crore rupees to pay to the company and i am ready to sign any document any confirmation which uh, you want me to sign and uh, when our person visited his premises he was living in a juggi and he was not even having the means to perhaps have tomorrow's uh, uh, or a week's food so uh, you know at many junctures you find such receivables now how do you value them somebody is giving you confirmation that he will pay you 10 crore rupees and he says that whenever i will get it i will give it to you sir but where do you value and give 10 crore rupee value to that uh, receivable i think so therefore the recoverability the means of recovering that amount from that trade receivable or for that matter any financial asset is a very important part of the values duty so and and a lot of information now is available publicly in case you know you have the company's uh, details you can find out their pan if you have the pan you can try to find you we can find out in case they have uh, defaulted in gst you can try and understand in case that company which this company which, which you are you are wanting this money from Uh, that company is also in, under insolvency in that process or in that system. Then what is the point of you know following up or saying that there is a value recoverable from that company? So the first thing rather when we do is a financial assets valuations is we see who is it recoverable from. We test whether that person has the capability to pay or not, and do and invest our energies in an aging analysis and understanding the accuracy of the recoverability at as the next step. after ruling out the possibility that uh, this after after determining that this person will be able to pay i think uh, vaishali is having a question na huh? uh, yes mr subara actually i was just thinking after vaishali's uh, question i will run the poll before taking next question yeah go ahead mr vaishali yeah mr subara in your presentation you mentioned that uh, uh information in relation to uh, projections is also required and it is a challenge yeah. why the projections are required in this type of valuation yeah uh, i think uh, ankit is the best person we had discussed and said ankit can you go ahead okay why uh, dcf okay we need to do in ibc valuation that is one uh, challenge so uh, in some companies ma'am uh, uh, what are we doing inherently we need to find out that we need to value a company's assets uh we have to find out its fair value which is almost equivalent to market value in ivs and we we want to find out the value it will fetch in case that company is liquidated on the crp date this is the objective that the value has been given by the act 
now in uh, in in various cases uh, it is possible for a company or it is foreseeable for the company to stay as a going concern and uh, uh, in that circumstance in case the valuer does not consider going concern at all and rather considers only the piecemeal assets uh, in some circumstances the piecemeal assets might have a value which is far lesser than the company as a whole or the company as a going concern because when you say the that this machinery is there and you know there is a one method of valuing that machinery where you say that okay what does this cost how old is it uh, what is the remaining useful life for this machinery how much will it cost in the market today that's one way of seeing that machinery the other way of seeing uh, that machinery is oh it is located in this land and building uh, it is located at this location and then you try and understand the income generating capability of that machinery now when you so when you see the income generating cap uh, capability of an overall system of assets it might throw a different value and therefore not bringing that value on the table will be injustice to the whole process because either you will be missing out on a value so there are two possible uh, ways it goes one you might find the going concern value to be higher than the value at cost for all these assets being separated the opposite is also possible where you find that say in case of a thermal based power plant which does not have a ppa what is the chance that the thermal based power plant will be ever be able to make that money or that income which uh, is the cost of the setup of that thermal power plant because without a ppa without any agreements it may not be able to sell its power at all unless and until the power situation improves in india so uh, of course it is based on a particular time today we have a opposite view where we have a shortage of Uh, uh power in the country but then uh, at one point in time we were saying that no nobody needs this power and nobody is ready to sign a long term ppa to uh, address or to buy that power so uh, therefore it is important to analyze the income generating capability of a particular unit and uh, have that analysis and give that analysis because in many cases as a going concern the values are very very different Okay, so it will uh, depend on the case to case basis. Yes, uh, Vaishal, I'll, 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 correct. Uh, Vaishal, I will give one more example where uh, once we are doing a valuation of a software company, the software company is not having any assets like land and building or plant and machinery, but they have only the software which is income generating. See, if I sell that software, nobody will be there because they are the having okay that proprietor and they they know the technology. and the directors itself okay the running the company then in that case what we did we did to like a, the income projection for next 5 years and we have valued unless if you don't use the dcf methodology where then company value is zero only because they don't sell the software and even if you sell the software nobody is there to ready to buy it hey in fact i have another example where of a power plant only okay where i was the rp so what happened is that we have a power purchase agreement but it could not be operationalized before the crp commenced so the uh, the valuers also did not give any value to the ppa but somehow during the crp period no we could operationalize it then the secure but then that was after commencement of crp so then the valuers said that they can't take the valuation is as on the date of commencement of crp only no so that's why they could not take that into consideration but halfway through we could not continue the operation of the ppa because the coal price have increased and the ppa operator is raising ppa Requires a lot of working capital because you have to pay the raw material immediately. Your collection comes is after three four months, so there is a huge amount of working capital cycle which you could not maintain over in the liquid in the CRP period. So finally, the PPA fell out. So the this may be required, it may not be required. So it's a, but anyway, whatever it is, entire thing has to be seen as on the date of commencement of CRP situation. Yes, sir. Commencement of CRP is of course an important date, and uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, true. But then, what is important is that. say when you are valuing this kind of an asset on a, on the crp date also you need to see what is the what is the most likely scenario in the future now in the most likely scenario in this future kind of in the case that you talked about if if uh, i would be asked to give an opinion i would try and say that the most likely scenario for this power plant is that this power plant will operate at its existing location and the plant and machinery the land and building value will not be teared apart and you know distributed or sold off in the market because it is reasonably complete to the extent that you were trying to operationalize the ppa so uh, yes that's a different call whether whenever the projections will be made for this thermal power plant whether you will consider the ppa or not consider the ppa that's a different call 
but i would assume a going concern if i were to value this kind of a plant i would not have done a going concern value valuation for a power plant which is only 30% complete there i would assume that it is certainly going to be scrapped okay one interesting question uh, that will come up you know like balance sheet uh, an auditor events occurring after the balance sheet did what happens to events occurring after this arp did but which have a bearing on value as on the uh, carp did for example you know uh, a power plant which did not have uh, a potential uh, buyer which did not have a ppa after uh, carp commences if if uh, if a potential buyer comes and you know signs a, a ppa does the valuer uh, uh, ignore the fact because if you go back to valuation standards the at least the indian valuation standards notified by icai which says that you know as regard to events occurring after the valuation date the the valuer was supposed to be judicially considering what is to be considered and what is not to be considered I mean, they didn't say one way or other whether you have to uh, take it or uh, leave it but i don't know that was under a general uh, valuation situation which is now we are talking about the carp situation where where the law is not a general one but uh, an ibc uh, one so i don't know i mean i would like your insight on what to do in uh, such situations so uh, uh, the uh, my my take is that uh, of course we are trying to find out the value on the crp date now in give you two three circumstances say there was a trade receivable and there has been a recovery from that trade receivable after crp date now that's a confirmation that that balance which was appearing on the crp date has now been realized so you have to give that value similarly say an income tax refund which is outstanding on the crp date has subsequently been received before the valuer could give, submit his report again an evidence that yes this value was confirmed so wherever such events happen which are confirming a particular value of on, on a particular date uh, that is useful the good part is that at least during carp there is no mandate or there is no uh, uh, possibility that the rp can sell something independently so those not too many events are happening where you know these values are being realized apart from financial assets which might be realized at times or stocks which might be realized so there the valuation i would say has a bearing uh, crp date valuation has a uh, is affected by subsequent events uh, but with respect to say a covid situation now covid was not there on the crp date covid came in afterwards will you decrease the values as on the crp date maybe no so it would rather i would say that whatever was the sentiment at the time of the crp date is what needs to go into the valuation report the act does not provide for any changes to be made because during the covid times there was hardly any buyer for all these test assets because of the sentiments and we were also getting requests from or uh, uh, or uh, requirements from rps that please reconsider the valuation report because this valuation is too high please give us please incorporate the covid discount so we reverted and said that we are supposed to give you the valuation as of the crp date it is up to you and the C- and the coc to decide and decrease your reserve price in case you feel that the covid discount is required to be incorporated but i cannot change my crp date valuation so okay this will apply to the existential question whether you know it is a going concern or not a going concern too right I mean, what you were mentioning were more of nitty gritties, like you know whether a debtor got realized or whether an income tax refund came through. But as regard to the basic question, you know whether it has to the fair value is to be determined on going concern basis, an event occurring after the um, valuation date or the CIRB commencement date, will it will it uh, change the perception on? Uh, no it would it would depend on what is available at site it is not important that something was functioning on the crp date and therefore it should be going concern so power plant as sir said he was trying to operationalize that power plant and uh, uh, maybe that power plant never operate, never went into operation before the crp date but everyone here would agree that 
the chances are that it will be operated as a going concern right we know all of us know that is yes, that power plant which is 100% complete the chances of scrapping it are, are almost almost zero next to zero so therefore it is it is uh, we know that it will idly be run as a going concern we got an opportunity where we were valuing a uh, a company or a or an or a company which was into manufacturing these crowns and closures now when we did the market research we thought that oh crowns and closures somebody will revive this industry start operating this plant again but when we did our market research we came to know that this is an extinct or this is an old industry now these crowns and closures are not even popular it are, they have been replaced by modern technologies so we for those plants where those technologies were obsolete we valued them towards scrap for those plants where those technologies could be adopted by somebody we said that yes there is a possibility to use it similarly say i will give you an example you find a plant in machinery you have a land and building plant in machinery which is located say in okline okline delhi now today everyone knows that that area is too expensive for any operation for a manufacturing operation and that factory has to be shifted out in case it has to be viable because the value of land and building there is too high for any factory to operate or be feasible so that's what i'm i'm trying to give you examples of how it is normally determinable that whether a company will remain a going concern or not okay thank you mr goel yeah i'll be launching the poll question now i request all the participants to uh, <clears throat> attempt the poll question and uh, while the poll question is on uh, i will like to state that you know this program is under cep credit as so whatever link uh the participants have got via email that link you have to click register give your ibba registration number and then only you will be eligible for uh, cep credit certificate like i can see one or two members have joined using uh, mr venkata subara uh, link they will not be able to get cep certificates in their name because the registration happened in the name of subara just thought of clarifying in case you would like to get cep credit certificates leave this meeting now and then use the link which you got by email by acva rbo having registered and then uh, give your ibba registration number then join this meeting you will be getting uh, cep credit hours uh, <clears throat> i am ending the poll now where is the poll question now Yeah, uh, Subaru, can you explain the answer for the poll question? You are on mute, Subaru, presently. Uh, here, the question is uh, where insolvency professional uh, got like two values from SFA. Like example, one value has given ten lakhs, the value, and another value has given twenty lakhs, uh, the value. Whether the insolvency professional has to appoint uh, their third value. as per uh, ibba regulations if the value between two values is significantly different uh, then it is required to appoint third valuer see in this in this example like 10 lakhs and 20 lakhs a like 100% difference is there yes the ip shall appoint third valuer maybe in situations where the value itself is some 100 crores and there is a difference of only uh, 100 crores and 50 lakhs then you need not to have because don't see that amount wise like uh, on 10 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs 100% and see that percentage how much here it is 100% different in case of big valuations maybe you, if there is a difference more than 5% then or 5 to 10% then you have to appoint the third valuer even as insolvency professional also we do same thing i think no most of the uh, members are uh, selected correct option Uh, Mr. Ravi Shankar, would you highlight uh, the no, no, one? No, madam. No, no, one, one, one thing the IRP should do in this case is that when there is such a significant difference, obviously there is a mismatch in the data. That means one of the values has not taken some data. Our assumptions are totally wrong. Maybe you don't are not taken a one particular land building or particular land initiatory, or some data. Otherwise, you know there can't be so huge difference between the parties. So first, IRP should try to. Understand why this difference is coming. Now, is not like that is not an influencing the value to change his plan, his valuation. But at the same time, he is trying to understand whether data and basic assumptions are correct. Still, if the values are making this kind of a different valuations only, 
then what the guidelines provide is if it is significant. Now, recently, IBBA also has clarified what is meant by that significant. It is 25%. If the valuation difference is 25% or more, then they have to appoint the third value. Uh, but sorry, first, step, first, step, first step is that he should find out why there is such a difference. Yeah. Sir, here one more question. Like uh, the insolvency professional will see that the three valuation combined are uh, particular. He will see SFA, land and building, and plant and machinery separate, separate. How he will do that significantly different? I sh ideally, you should do each item wise. Okay, yeah, so SFA, item. SFA, 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 land, land, plant emission, plant emission. That's what you should do. Oh, yeah. uh, so, in that, what combination he has to select? The highest or the lowest? Like between SFA, I have one value. Between land and building, I have one value. Which value? That, no, no, that no. no, no. no we'll, take, we'll take expert advice from Ms. Ankit Goyal only. Because I didn't, I didn't get into that. Because wherever I did, after this, the first round of discussion, we could get into a. Uh, reasonable uh, valuation, but Shankit. Uh, actually, you got my point, no, Ankit? I got it, got it. Right. Uh, got it. But so, Shankit, if you can. So basically, I have totally six values, so what combination should I take? So, uh, uh, if you have six values, uh, the comparison has to be between uh, each asset class uh, majorly, yes. and uh, rather, even beyond each asset class, there has to be an exercise to reconcile the values of particular assets also at times because you need we need to understand that the liquidation value that we are giving during the CIRP process as valuers may also be used at a future date to decide the value which a particular secured creditor will get in case he's a dissenting creditor so and that is a uh, that is a that is something which can be very tricky and it can actually bring a lot of litigation so say for an example, if HDFC Bank say has given a car loan to a company and that is one of the loans that is outstanding as on the CRP date. And if you value the car at an unreasonably low amount or an unreasonably high amount, then HDFC Bank would then uh, maybe in some circumstances be a dissenting creditor will be eligible to that value which you have given to that car. So therefore, sometimes each and every asset also becomes important and therefore, uh, uh, reconciling that between uh, the two reports is important. Uh, now, how do you reconcile that? You say pick up an SFA report, pick up the second report. Now you say that, okay, uh, what has each value done with each asset? And in case you feel that one value has not taken into consideration certain information which the other value has and he should have done that, then you supply that information to that value and ask him to reconsider that valuation now on the basis of that information available to him. Uh, therefore, it is normally very advised that in case you're sharing information with valuers, you're sharing the same information with both valuers rather than creating a difference in the documents and information available with the valuers also. Uh, and then it comes to assumptions. Now, so, so one valuer can say that, okay, I will assume that uh, debtors less than 90 days will fetch 80% value. The other one says they will fetch 50% value. Now, this assumption is something which is very different to change. Unless and until you can produce, you know, you can go into your books of accounts or the RP can go into the company's books of accounts and actually try to find out evidence that, you no, know, the actual scenario is this. So, uh, there the difference might remain. And that might require a third valuation. Uh, Mr. Goyal, uh, again... Uh... You, we, in the beginning, we, you mentioned about, you know, uh, land and building and uh, the apartments being part of uh, inventory. So I had one, uh, uh, I had done one evaluation of a large uh, builder where what the way I looked at it, you know, there were apartments where 90% had been paid. Okay, the, the buyer had paid 90%, but uh, the property had not been conveyed. So I said, you know, there were, this is substantial, uh, uh, the property has passed substantially. So I took only the residual value of 10% uh, as uh, the asset, I included only that much in the asset. Whereas the other valuer took uh, the entire 100% as the asset on the technical plea that the property has not been conveyed. The property remains with the builder asset and the 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 buyer who has paid 90% will stand in the queue, you know, in the waterfall mechanism to get to his share. So how do you 
so there was a big difference in valuation between valuer one and valuer two. Not because not because the apartment was valued differently, but the percentage share was you know looked at differently. So uh, like my take there is that one stage of a flat or a home buyer's right. Mm -hmm. that is very established and that is very clearly you know uh, established across is that if somebody has got possession of that flat then that is no longer the company's asset but so the title is, has been conveyed or not title has been conveyed can still have different meanings possession has been transferred or possession has been handed over or not is a different so possession is one part of transfer of title the other part is the requirement for registration of the title now in many cases you will find where home developer cases are involved you will find that the registration has not happened because the land owning agencies government agencies are not allowing the registration in absence of all the dues being paid but because the builder has completed the construction he has transferred the physical possession of that property to the home buyer now but in this was, this was not that case this... so in this case the possession is not transferred so first stage is possession transferred or not transferred the possession has not had not been transferred so in case possession has not been transferred now the next question is which is still uh, pending before the supreme court and in in courts to decide that do home buyers have the absolute right or the right to specific performance against the advance that they have been they have given now in case you say that liquidation happens for a home buyer or a for a construction company real estate company which is constructing a project say the resolution does not happen liquidation happens now in liquidation in case you say that the liquidation will happen subject to the ultimate scenario that the home buyers will get their flats in that case the liquidation formula is very clear that what will happen is that the home buyers will pay whatever is their due balance Uh, the uh, pending cost of construction will be completed, and whatever is the deficit or excess will be either contributed by the person who is buying that real estate project under liquidation, or it will be uh, uh, it will be a different it will be a scenario where the uh, uh, the home buyers will contribute and the construction will be completed. Right? This is one scenario where the right to specific performance of the home buyers is recognized. Now, on the other side, in case you say that when liquidation order will be passed, the home buyers will become creditors. They will not have any right to the specific flat that they had booked. Now, in this circumstance, you will say that okay, somebody will acquire that home, that complex and that project. He will complete the construction with his money, and then he will sell the flats in the market, and he will fetch whatever is available in the market and pay whatever he can distribute to the home buyers after paying off other liabilities. now here this right to specific performance is being ignored so the method of valuation will be very different in the first circumstance versus the second circumstance now home Which buyers is, is now one. typically typically home buyers want you to value using the first approach not because uh, 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 they uh, will the valuation report will somehow benefit them but uh that of course the specific performance right is given to them but home buyers like that approach better wherever banks are involved because it gives a lesser value and because banks are normally dissenting creditors the banks are then required to be given lesser amount but in case of second option where you do not recognize the right to specific performance for a home buyer you are then putting the bank and the home buyer in the same bucket so if the home buyer is taking if the banker is taking a 50% haircut the home buyer will also take a 50% haircut so uh, that is the debate now the supreme court uh, in amrapali's case in other cases has given a decree which in some manner gives a preference to the home buyers over any other person be it banks be it operational creditor be it anyone else so based on that premise the method that is popularly being used today is that method which recognizes the specific performance but some valuers like our entity gives both the valuations because we don't want somebody to come back to us tomorrow and say that oh you have taken this method where is the other method or there could have been a higher value that would have been allotted or given to a financial creditor 
why has a lesser value and then there is a general question which is floating around that why are home buyers supposed to be better than a financial predator so somebody who took a mortgage uh, got a mortgage gave a secured creditor became a secured creditor uh, how is that person legally supposed to be a poorer person as compared to somebody who booked a house answer to that is what bank <laughs> <laughs> answer to that is uh, the ability of home buyers to maybe you know crowd the court room with 50 or 100 or 1000 people and then that's the problem that's the idea i believe the banker can't take 1000 people with him to the court right <laughs> okay but yeah. even in the amarpalis uh, case all that the supreme court said is home home buyer will be in the footing of a, a financial creditor it, it, it didn't put them on a pedestal higher than the uh, financial creditor no so we were appointed as rps for amrapali's case and we are still uh, begging before the supreme court to give us the rp dues which was you know because which were pending because of the due process that was followed under ibc for that uh, for that case but home buyers are getting their flats <laughs> or so at least the, the bank is working, taking almost major haircut or, hit, or at least no i'm saying in this case the rp is also taking a haircut <laughs> for the home buyers to get their flats <laughs> okay. it's more like Thank a sympathetic you. view the uh, the authorities have taken can we run through some of the uh, public uh, questions uh, shilpa uh, yeah this poll question can you just uh, highlight a minute it may, i think it's already discussed but you can just say it and then we'll go ahead so when i lost the poll question where is it yeah uh, it like who shall uh, uh, value inventory in ibc valuation yes okay uh, as uh, the panel discussed it is all depending upon like how the assignment starts okay the ip itself is okay the ip will have discussion with the plant administrator and sfa valuer and if plant administrator it, it predominantly go to to him if they are not accepting with their experience or which they don't know or sfa or plant, then ip has to select okay uh, He has to provide that inventory valuation. At least then it can be certified by PM valuer or SFA valuer. And the poll is saying it is IP choice or SFA valuer. Okay, most of the things. It is all depending upon case case basis. This little bit question can be extended to residuary assets also. No, few assets like livestock or something are there. Hmm. Better to that you know IP select which valuer has to select so that the assignment can be complete. Yes, yes. See in livestock, anyhow that. Plant and Mister Evaluator will not uh, uh, take it forward, okay, to do the valuation. Like as a residuary asset, it is the duty of SFA Valuator or IP and RP can dis, uh, RP and our Register Valuator can discuss both and they can decide it. Even Register Valuator also can get uh, from other expert. It can be added. See, for example, when we are doing like uh, uh, car, uh, whatever uh, the price, which we go car twenty four or some other four one, we will get the price by giving the car model number. same thing we can attach here also we have to do some uh, market survey something and we can attach and we can give the value uh, members please note the question is not on uh, commencement of uh, you know carp proceeding it is liquidation process okay on uh, on the question of who will do sorry i have a question may i ask yeah yeah uh, so i understand that uh, uh, whenever we are uh, valuing the receivables uh, there is a aging which is considered and each uh, valuer uh, and rp is having their own views of uh, some assumptions in terms of uh, percentage of uh, value uh, is taken i want to know is there uh, by any chance any uh, specific guidance from ibbi on this Uh, number one and number two is as per me, uh, if there is no balance confirmation, the value of receivable has to be zero. And if we go by uh, any aging and assumptions, that may not be appropriate. Uh, please uh, advise. What What are your thoughts? See, basic thing is that you first of all you should be confirmed. You should be happy. Say you should be RV. Okay, RV should be confident that the amount is recoverable. Then this aging concept comes into picture. supposing you do you say that that fellow is not the this is the data is not identifiable is not available at all then there is no point in doing the next step the aging analysis is only for those uh, receivables which are receivable 
as per the IRP or as per books and as per RV's own uh, experience, RV's own thinking. Okay. So if if you are if you are not, if for the first step only you are confident that it is not receivable or nothing, then zero. But if it is receivable and there is a regular invoice raised or an agreement is there but still is not paying, then you go into the next step of aging. No, no, Mr. Ravi Shankar, the question is, okay, regular invoice has been raised, invoice uh, has been acknowledged, but he hasn't, uh, and some time has passed, obviously, by the time CARP, it'll be a year or two, which has passed from the, there'll be nothing which is 30 days uh, old in, in a CARP company, okay, right. usually, unless That's it is a going concern. So, in such situation, if a balance confirmation is not available, what is the use of uh, you know relying on the invoices and delivery challans acknowledgements? So that's what balance the information is, is 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 significance is significant as to the intent of the debtor to uh, pay. Otherwise, so the not, debtor is not going no, to confirm. Sir, sir, one thing is that he is not doing balance confirmation, or is he contesting the payment only supply only? No, most cases there is no contest. Also, simply there will be no response. Then see, if, depending on the situation, if that is the situation, it should be nil. But supposing, nil, he, says, right? suppose, supposing okay. he says that I'll pay now, I don't have, I'll pay later. So something, that kind of thing is there. Then you can say percentage method. Okay. Okay. So when, uh, when uh, in insolvency cases, when we are trying to recover money from receivables, so we see that, okay, what is the information available with us? So at times the CD is cooperative and we have the invoices, we have the POs, we have the ledgers, we have some kind of emails where the uh, CD has confirmed that this uh, these goods or services were sold to, the, the other party has confirmed that the goods or services were sold to them. But they are still refusing to pay because the legal advice that those people get is that why do you need to pay? Why do you need to pay to the RP? Because there is no strong uh, 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 action which an RP can take against a person who has to pay the CD. So uh, therefore, uh, a confirmation coming in is of course very good. That would finalize the number. But in some cases, it is possible that a confirmation will not come. Say, I will give you an example of a case where we were trying to value a trade receivable. It was a trade receivable come or a, or a claim. And it was under arbitration. The arbitration award was awarded by an arbitrator. And uh, it was now pending before the high court for further adjudication. Now, there the normal scenario and the normal understanding in the industry is that in case the arbitrator has appointed, has approved a claim, which the company has made against a third person, then there is a good chance that that claim will stay and that claim will be recoverable. It might take two years, three years for that money to finally come in. But after more litigation, after spending some money on litigation, that money should come in. So in those circumstances, a confirmation will not come. But you have an arbitration order which is in the favor of the CD. So in those circumstances or other circumstances, it might be required that you give some value or uh, a substantial value to that claim or that trade receivable, even if there is no confirmation. If the documents support that, the money will be realized. Uh, Subarav, can you please uh, state the poll answer so that we can go to the next poll? You are on mute. Yeah, yeah. whether validation is required after commencement of uh, liquidation process and most of the members selected is optional. Yes, uh, it is optional. The liquidator can take the take for take it forward that uh, whatever the validation report he got during CRP process. If there is a significantly different the values uh, which has been reduced from the insolvency commencement date to liquidation commencement date because there are cases where even uh, two three years also is happening. Uh, the insolvency cases. In that cases, the value may be go up or may be go down. In that case, it is the uh, IP is uh, optional. He can appoint uh, again the values during liquidation and he can get it the valuation. Uh, I, I, I have one question. Uh, see, we, you know, we have spoken about what the practical challenges that uh, I know we uh, uh, face when we are doing the valuation. But one of one part I think that we have to, uh, missed to discuss who will be responsible for giving the representation to the 
the basis can be historical the basis can be based on the industry standard uh, that's how what you rely on and because it is uh, something which is assumed therefore the idea of sharing a draft report uh, by the valuer to the rp is a good idea so that whatever is the market study of the rp and whatever is the market study of the rv can then be uh, collectively rep- can then collectively represent uh, the uh, in the valuation report Uh, but we need RPs... to we we need to understand that uh, that in many scenarios, uh, somebody who is aggrieved by some kind of a resolution plan, who can be aggrieved, it can be a field resolution applicant, it can be the promoter, it can be the workers who are representing the promoters, it can be anyone. They can challenge anything in the valuation report. So in a recent case where there was a uh, uh, in case of uh, this Appu Hotels, there is a there is a case where. Uh, 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 a lot of observations were made by the court, and the, one of the observations made by the court was that the valuer never visited the site. So, if the valuer never visited the site, how did he do the value? Because the allegation can be very simple, right? That somebody can go through your valuation report and say that, okay, you have not mentioned when did you visit and when did you physically verify the assets, and that allegation can 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 actually be a very uh, very difficult allegation to defend. So. uh coming back to the point uh, um the assumptions have to be well structured so that they are not challengeable in the court or the chances of somebody putting them through the test of judiciary is lessened okay the normally the, the pra- practice oh, once again subara the practice um, now is that you know the rps don't uh, give an mrl like you know companies do for uh, uh cs so, so they they say was whatever is there you see uh, and you do your uh, valuation so the comfort of taking a management representation letter is mostly missing in the case of uh, ibc valuation so you, you are on your own the mrl mrl is something that i i don't think we've ever asked for an mrl from an rp because he's he's actually you know uh, trying to replace the management giving him an additional responsibility of signing an M- mrl where he signs and says that okay this was the inventory which was available at the premises will not be something that will be uh, uh, will be fruitful uh, because he's also a professional you are also a professional as a valuer so on the other hand the process that we follow internally is that we list down we we make very detailed lists of uh, uh, the very very detailed is some some uh, disclosures we made i will talk about those disclosures in the valuation report itself so one we uh, list down uh, the information that has been received and we write, write down specific dates on which that information was received this helps us defend any allegation one of delay in valuation because in most circumstances the information comes in piecemeal basis because the rp is also getting it on piecemeal basis and it might be coming in over 4 months 5 months 6 months so if that is the track record that you can show that okay this information was received on this date this date this date this date it kind of helps and what also gives the reader a very very clear perspective that okay this much information has is what is relied on and then we also create a table where we say that uh, information which was requested or documents which were requested which were not provided so there we list down those documents and then write down the assumption taken in absence of those documents so these two charts i believe are it's an essential part of an ibc valuation they really help in one limiting the valuer's liability uh, secondly they also give a very very clear indication to the rp that in case he has certain information that he has hidden from you 
and which is forming part of that schedule then the responsibility will come to him or in case he feels that oh he can do something extra to get some information then he will do that because in in many cases see what happens we are trying to value a bank balance now the rp is saying i don't have the bank statement i can't provide it to you he normally provides it after he sees the draft report mentioned mentioning that the bank statement is not available in absence of which we have taken the balance as zero because if anyone reads his valuation report any creditor he would ask the rp that why were you not able to arrange the bank statement what went wrong yeah and and one more thing kusum like uh, you we need not to rely on only on the financials which they have given on insolvency commencement date where we can request the tally of the company and where the even you have the access you can ask the gst login id password where you can see whether really there were sales and purchases as well as and also like the income tax you can you can get it to get a lot of information you can have discussion with corporate data and we can ask those invoices to rely on that yes, as you said we cannot rely only on the financials we have to get other uh, uh, sources of information we have to do in, in see in our one practical case the trade data is uh, uh, for like uh, carry forward last 5 years and it belongs to almost some 30 crores and how can you value that uh, 30 crores okay because the company itself is okay to get more loans or to show like window dressing balance sheet they are carry forwarding without written off because as a charter statute charter they, they have to written off okay after certain time but which they were not doing in that cases we can take it to zero because it is carry forwarding last 5 years recording uh, thank you any other, any other points uh, no other poll question any any questions uh, from the members uh, attendees Uh, Ankit, I have one question. Where, uh, as a value, we have given the fair value and liquidation value. Do you have any percentage? Uh, for example, in the case of trade data or inventory, uh, fair value is some ten crores of uh, inventory. Then I will give eighty percent of liquidation value. Like I will reduce. Like because even when I had discussion with the land and building valuers, they will say that okay, sir, we will reduce fifteen to twenty percent of fair value to get the liquidation value. Like, uh, are we are going to do like that? Okay, like certain percentage, fifteen percent reducing and giving the liquidation value, because everybody is uh, okay. They will look into the fair value more. Then when it comes to liquidation value, everybody will reduce some ten, fifteen percent, and they will provide the value. Anything? Any uh, comments on this? So this this number is not mentioned anywhere, and I believe it is very difficult to mention this discount number. That okay, what would be the discount number? But we need to understand, and maybe we can have some inputs from everyone who is participating today. That what are the factors based, or what are the reasons why we reduce this fifteen, twenty five, twenty percent as per your opinion between the fair value and the liquidation value? I'm saying, what are the factors which create this difference? okay uh, one one uh, one thing i can see is that you know where you know uh, institutional uh, receivables are there like you know bank bank balances big companies government receivables there won't be any distinction between uh, fair value and uh, liquidation value but that's that's that's, that's okay the, but I, my question is that for a land and building asset the way okay. subrao sir said what do you feel as per your understanding of fair value versus liquidation value and you know the circumstances of the two 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 different values why do we give this discount what are the factors which are required to be taken into into consideration when we are deciding this 10 15 10 15 20 25 percent discount yeah. see normally what happens in i and second super in this what happens in normal case is that if it is a registration plan then normally we'll give them almost like okay, one and after two years or three years to pay the whole consideration okay whereas if it goes to liquidation the blenders don't give not more than 30 days maximum they give some 90 days is what the code provides so within 90 days they have to pay everything so which means in the case of a liquidation the payment should be upfront in case of that a will, in case of that plan, will make the liquidation like, value yes. higher than the fair value <laughs> no liquidation should be less liquidation should be that's why liquidation value is less no that's because 
Suppose same plan, same building. If I get in a plan, I'll get two years, three years to pay. But if I get same building, if I get in liquidation, I need to pay today, within thirty days. So, after 30 days, 12, so, so, so whenever, that's why, so whenever the whenever the bankers are evaluating a resolution plan, they are always looking at uh, the value after. Uh, Uh, after discounting for the fact that it is coming, money is coming after three years. They always see the present value when they're comparing different resolution plans. So that uh, that that is normally the process. It is not that somebody will say that okay, two hundred crores will be paid after three years. So today it will become two hundred crores of fair value. So let me try and differentiate between fair value and liquidation value. Fair value is mostly market value as defined in IVS. the market value assumption the market value uh, uh, basis assumes that the transaction is happening in the market and uh, the, it it assumes that there is no urgency to sell from the seller the buyer is not having urgency to buy it assumes prudence it assumes a proper due diligence of the asset right these are the things that are assumed in a market approach uh, in in a market value basis as defined in One zero five IVS one zero five. Now, when it comes to liquidation value, liquidation value. Let's first talk about liquidation value as a going concern. Now, if you talk about a fair value as a going concern versus liquidation value as a going concern, what is according to you is changing? I think what is changing is the uh, uh, what is changing is that the urgency to sell. is now getting or is required to be captured in the liquidation value because when you are liquidating an asset on a particular date you are not giving or you are not exposing the asset in the market for the reasonable period of time which is it, it should ideally be exposed to what is the reasonable time that an asset should be exposed to to sell you want to sell a mobile phone of yours what reasonable time do you think will it be sold in the market at the market price anyone Should I say a week's time should be good enough? That's yes. It. Yeah, but in case I want to sell my residential house, will you say that a week's time is good enough to find the correct market price? Two, three months. Yeah. So there is a reasonable time that an asset is required to be exposed to. Number one. Number two, there is a reasonable effort and a reasonable money which is required to be spent. So today, when you try and sell an asset, you would say that okay you will try to find the best possible way to reach out to the market and try and explore the sale maybe for selling your phone you will go to the market wherever second hand phones are bought and you will try to go to three four shops or you will go to olx or you will go to quicker and try and post your phone and try to find out so you will first say that okay let me put in a price which is 20% higher than what others have put in and then you know reduce it uh, 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 as and when you don't find a value so that process is absent in the liquidation of most ibc cases because now you are having a reserve price you are putting the price auction in the market there is also some limitation on the prudence that somebody can have so somebody who is getting the uh, phone from you in the market would say test the phone make sure that the screen is okay the screen is not duplicate spend good time in analyzing the phone but if you are trying to sell it urgently then maybe you know or you're not even available to talk about the phone then how will somebody check the phone maybe you know now you get a phone which is not even getting switched on will you pay the same price for it as you would pay in case you somebody shows you the phone all on and all working you will not right you will maybe buy it at 25% of the price that you would otherwise would have bought bought it for because you are not able to test it so when you have a when you differentiate between fair value and liquidation value for any asset you're testing these considerations that how urgent how does the price get affected because of the urgency to sell from the seller's side how does the price get affected because of lack of prudence how does the uh, price get affected because of lack of uh, time which is normally required to sell that asset and these are the factors which need to be considered in that percentage as i said maybe for a mobile phone which you are trying to do a value maybe the fair value will be 100 rupees the liquidation value may be 25 rupees so there there is no barometer that it has to be 15% discount because in case you can establish that in this case the prude, lack of prudence lack of uh, due diligence will result into this kind of a value depreciation then you can write that in their valuation report and give that discount 
so that is my take on this discount that it will always vary but yes ideally a valuer should talk about why he is putting in 15% he should say that okay 15% is because of these 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 factors this is my basis of deciding that 15% it should not be arbitrary that 15% is 15% i thought 15% is good that's why i put it so some discussion on how what are the factors which go into that 15% will help you uh, uh, substantiating that 15% if that uh, requirement comes up Yes. Another, another, another small doubt. How do you fix the reserve price in case of a liquidation? Because you have a liquidation, suppose you have a liquidation value of say 100. The, do you stack uh, the, your uh, reserve the, price with 100? The, law is, very, the law is very clear that the reserve price for the first auction is required to be the average of the liquidation values of the two valuation reports. Sometimes what happens is that the COC requires the liquidator to start higher. So in some circumstances, say the, the uh, bankers believe that the asset is worth 10 crore rupees, whereas the liquidation, uh, the, the liquidation values from the value are say 4 crores. Now in that circumstance, it sometimes becomes require, a requirement for the liquidator to start with that 10 or start with some other amount. Uh, and therefore, those gaps then sometimes create an, create an issue. Uh, the second thing that is important is that sometimes the valuation reports are not accurate. So in some circumstances, we have seen that we have advertised an asset as an IPE and uh, tried to sell it. And we have seen, you know, tremendous interest in that asset. So there we have revised the reserve price to be a higher amount uh, because uh, to protect ourselves that in case accidentally there is a collusion, there is some issue where the assets get sold at that reserve price, whereas the expected value because of the market interest is way higher then uh, we would be in a spot. So getting, gauging the market sentiment is important. So in case you get too much interest for an asset which you're trying to sell, maybe you're uh, selling it or selling it for cheap. That is what you would believe even if you're selling your own personal asset. But isn't uh, the RP or the liquidator uh, be bound by the valuer's report to fix the reserve price? No. You can set to fix a reserve, a higher reserve price. Okay. It is not okay. that they have to conduct an auction, pull out that reserve price, which is the values report. And in case somebody comes and says that, okay, I will give you the same price, uh, then they have to sell it. Uh, they can change that. Okay. But, but it should not be less than the uh, registered of value. Course. Of price. course, the reserve can price. Be, can be yeah. So, so the first option can't be less than the reserve price. And yes. then subsequently, you can reduce it by a specific percentage. The normal industry standard is 10%. Sometimes you get, you try to generate or, you know, try to substantiate and say that, no, the asset value is much lesser. So you decrease it by a higher amount. Therefore, too high a value actually, you know, uh, uh, causes a lot of problems for the RP uh, because he, for the liquidator also, because he's actually losing out on fee because had he been able to sell the asset in the first six months, he would have got a higher fee also. So therefore, uh, it becomes very, very important to understand that uh, is the valuation report giving the correct price or not. And, and one more, uh, Ankit here, uh, see, there is a valuation report which I have seen that, okay, like I came to know that the valuer has given SFA valuer negative value they have given. Huh? Uh, two values, okay. Is it, is it an asset or is it a liability? No, that's what. <laughs> they have Sorry, liability. <laughs> I no, missed I on. I missed out. So, what was the value that the See, value? They, they have given negative value. Negative value. Yeah, it, it is a real estate company where okay, the corporate debtor has to spend more amount to, to de deliver the uh, flats to the home buyers, and okay, the amount they collected. Uh, already home buy from ninety percent, but construction has not been done even 30 40 percent. Where uh, uh, assets are not there, it has come for negative value. So there, the, the the trouble comes in when there are multiple projects in the same company. Now in that case, sometimes what happens is there is a deficit in one company or one project, and there is a surplus in the other project. In those circumstances, it has to be netted off. But at an overall level, for the company level, I don't think any asset value can be negative. But at a project level, it can be negative in home buyer cases or home and in, yes. in real estate cases. Yeah, but but anyhow, uh, see, since we are talking about project, 
even uh, some cases where we have seen uh, in the especially valuation of real estate we have to do only for project valuation only we are doing okay even uh, company is uh, giving okay the company will be having lot of subsidiaries but valuation is going to do one one project wise one for one mm. that particular project no so Should all the CD, projects no? all the projects which are belonging to the cd are normally done by the valuer of course subsidiary companies uh, assets are not required or their real estate projects are not required to be valued any investments made by the holding company in the subsidiary or any loans given of course are required to be valued okay uh, is there any audience questions we are running out of uh, time shilpa uh, actually there was one question on uh, usage of valuation report like who are entitled for valuation report uh, like is it coc can coc get the entire valuation report and uh, whether it can be shared with promoters who are submitting the plan who are not submitting the plan uh, promoters promoters don't get access to the valuation report uh, the coc members uh, do get the access to the valuation complete, complete, complete. valuation complete valuation report uh, after they give that undertaking of confidentiality no, no sir the, the code says value it doesn't say the report so that's why this question is coming but uh, as a practice we give the entire report to the cosi members whenever the plan is uh, coming actually there no there's no plan there's no giving to anybody first first issue second is that though, even though the code says that give only the value the general practice is to give the entire report so that they can cosi members also can verify the item by item of the report Many many times they make us compare the report with the report that they have got when they sanctioned the loan or whatever it is, or even subsequent valuations the bank got done. Yeah, so these days there is a new system now. There is a new system where the bankers are now insisting for their impaneled valuers to be also uh, given the job of doing the IBC valuation. because now they their the problem that they are facing is that their valuations and their records is say 10 crores for an asset which may not be in the market today not even fetch 4 crores so that difference they are not able to explain internally that why were we getting a 10 crore valuation although the diff, that 10 crore valuation was normally you know was something that they are keeping in record to uh, keep saying that you no know, there is substantial justify, value just way their loan justify lack of provisioning right. or justify their loan so this is a new system which has started that the banker now wants their impaneled valuers or their trusted valuers to be part of the uh, to be appointed by the rp so that the valuation can be some way influenced by them uh, ankit even not only appointing by the bankers in some cases what they are doing okay they are not relinquishing assets to the liquidator and mm. with through relinquishing they are themselves okay they are appointing their valuers and they are selling with their reserve price sir. even they are intercepted that that happens sometimes but in most circumstances there you know what happens is that that process becomes very complicated for them to take up because uh, one they have to then give the fee to the rp or to the liquidator on that asset then they have to report and take onus or take responsibility of fetching the right right uh, price in the market so in most of our cases rather we have seen the opposite that they are inclined to surrender the asset and let the liquidator sell it and let the responsibility be transferred maybe uh, in some circumstances it might be the other way yeah. yes no no the thing is that if suppose it's a consortium lending or a multiple lending then what happens is that no bank can uh, take assets on its own name because it's a consortium lending unless they pay off the other lenders suppose there are four lenders and then four of them have a common security on that Then they can't. Then they have to give to lender. Yes, I uh, liquidate round D. Then one last question: How do we ensure completeness? That you know whether all the elements have been actually considered uh, for the purpose of arriving uh, at fair value and liquidation value. For example, if they give us a letter, so uh, this you know, how do we ensure that there is one second letter is not required to be included? so uh, normally what we do there is we reconcile the uh, details given to us with the financial uh, statements last available financial statements 
So in case there is a difference, we point it out to the RP. In case the difference is uh, uh, is not not closed, then we just note it down in the valuation report that the that the financial uh, that the gross value of say plant and machinery in the uh, in the fixed asset uh, schedule in the balance sheet was this much, but we have been given a list with values of this much, uh, and we are assuming that that is the complete list. So that kind of a, a process is normally followed. Thank you. I have uh, one question from the participants. Uh, this uh, professional uh, IP is not the valuer is not able to get any information from the IP. No documents, no information. But yes, the engagement is complete. The assignment is given to the valuer. And in his case, it's more than a year. The IP has not given any info documents. So what is the action to be taken by valuer? What is the intimation to be done? What is the liability of the value? Can you just throw a light on this point? So in such circumstances, what the RP should have idly done and would have idly done is file a application in the NCLT asking for the promoters to contribute information or the court to pass certain orders against promoters to give that information which is required. In some circumstances where the NCLT is also not able to get the promoter's help or there is no asset at all, the case normally goes and the, the RP then subsequently normally goes to NCLT and says that I'm I'm now you're not you're not able to help me with the information. I'm not getting a hold of any asset. There is no creditor who is able to give me any information of any asset of this company. So with all this information on record, you're requested to directly dissolve the company. Don't even start liquidation proceedings, directly go to make it to a dissolution state. Also in this kind of a case, uh, uh, or rather it is a learning for everyone that before taking up any assignment, we as valuers should try and identify in case the company has any asset. In case the company has no assets, then there is a possibility that all the time that you have spent on this assignment will go down the drain and you will not get anything out of it. Because uh, in case of companies where there is no land in building, there is no plant in machinery, and there is only say maybe 50 crores of trade receivables in the books of accounts, which, not, which may not fetch even a rupee. So in those circumstances, uh, uh, you will not get anything out of that assignment as a fee. There's a, there's a high probability of that happening. Because you need to understand as we need to understand as valuers that the fee realization depends on some assets being part of that CD. In case there are no assets, very, very high chances that the RP will also perhaps get peanuts or nothing. Yeah, shall we end the session? Any uh, participants have, we can take one, one last query from participants. In, in, in fact, uh, Shilpa, in fact, now, now we, now, in fact, now we are better off. In the initial days of IBC, if you had seen, the, the value should have been appointed within seven days of this commencement of CRP. Now, at least uh, IRP need not appoint, it has gone to the 47th day. So, initial days, it was still horrible. We have many cases where the RPs appoint us and they appoint us and there is no information that is coming in. And after a point in time, we can come to know that the case has been settled, there is a stay, there is something happening. So, many cases because, you know, the NCLT sometimes takes time in handling the cases. So, but the 47 days come. So, the 47 day compliance is required to be followed by the RP. So, he follows that compliance. Although there may not be a requirement for valuation in that case because the case is in any way not going through the whole CRP process. Sir, in, in Bangalore, most of the cases, IRP only will appoint the valuers since okay, the adjudicating authority has to approve that appointment of IRP to RP. It is not in other NCLT, particularly in Bangalore. IRP to RP, the NCLT has to approve. All NCLTs no, have to approve. It, it, it will approve, but okay, it will take some time, three to four months. Okay, again, CO, once the COC meeting is over, again, we have to file an application before adjudicating authority. Then it has to come hearing and order. That is that is how it is everywhere, sir. Yeah. That is how it has to happen. The IRP to RP, the NCLT has to uh, pass an order. Without that, the appointment does not happen. Sir, if the same IRP to RP appointing, I don't think so. Okay, in other uh, NCLTs, they are filing applications, sir. If the new RP is coming, yes, you have to get adjudicated. Yeah, oh, that, 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 of course. That, that yeah. is the, even, yes. That's what, in, in Bangalore, what happens, even the same IRP is becoming to RP, we have to get uh, adjudicating authority approval. 
no no that is not required as per law irp will become automatically rp after 30 days so sir, there is sir, no requirement no such requirement if rp is get replaced then only you have to go for uh, to educating authority for uh, an order I think it might be a might might be a procedure being followed by NCLT yeah. Bangalore. It, it yeah. might it might find a, it might be reviewed by NCLT Bangalore at a future date. But if this is a custom, no sir. In fact, is, no, 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 sir. In fact, uh, earlier initial days of NCLT Bangalore, we were not up. Uh, we're not making a separate application. The same IRP is continued as RP. But mm -hmm. once the judges changed it, then they they changed the method also. They said that now. Once the even same IRP to RP, we need to make an application and get a order because the lo more logic is that in the forms that we are filing CRP one two three four no, in that there is a reference to order of the NCLT where I IRP is converted to RP. That format also is saying that. So as in today Bangalore, we are initially we are not doing, but now yes, we have. So as per light is correct, but as a procedure in Bangalore, we are following. All right, so there can always be certain variations in the NCLT practices also, since we are a diverse nation. So there uh, can always be some differences. Yes, it depends on the from which high court that judge is coming or from which the high court that registrar <laughs> is coming. Of course. So the system is changing here. Uh, yeah. Now let's call it a day. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's my privilege to convey a vote of thanks uh, to the esteemed panelists uh, for today. Uh, I'm sure all of the participants have immensely benefited out of the experience and the veteran, uh, Mr. Ankit Goel, Mr. Ravi Shankar Devarakonda, and Mr. Venkat Subara, and very nicely moderated by Mr. Ramamurthy Srinivasan. Uh, I thank on behalf of ACVA and uh, Bangalore Valiers Association. Uh, the panel discussion had, has been really of good value. Uh, <clears throat> we will follow, we'll uh, share the feedback session for all the participants. Uh, please convey your feedback. Uh, yes, Mr. Ramurthy, you would like to share something? No, nothing. I mean, my, from my side, uh, thanks to everyone, nothing more than that. I'm sure the participants got an overview of the uh, IBC valuation and whatever we have promised that, you know, whatever challenges you have been facing, you, I think you got a solution or certain perspective to go ahead and take up your valuations with more confidence. And uh, at least you understand that fellow valuers also have the same problem. Uh, uh, Shilpa, I, I, I think now the values may rethink okay whether to take accept that valuation or not. I <laughs> even that I right. that was not going on my mind. You know, I should see whether IP is cooperative or not, whether my fees will come or not. Then I have to take up the valuation. <laughs> No, I think we should. One should never let work go, and all work should be accepted as long as there is a good chance that your fee will come. Uh, no work is small work. That is my belief. And I think thank you everyone for having this uh, session. Thank you BVA for always having wonderful sessions. This was very helpful, and this was very learning for me also. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for thank your you active all participation. All. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shilpa. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.